We have with us here uh, Mr. Mansoor Khan to present on the topic, the third curve. Wondering what a third curve is? Well, I think we need to wait and watch what he has to say. But before that, I would like to give you a quick introduction of Mr. Mansoor. An alumnus of IIT Mumbai, Cornell University and MIT Boston, he began his career as a filmmaker and went on to make feature films that won several national awards. In 2013, he moved to Kunur to realize his life's aspiration of starting a self-supporting organic farm. Spread over 22 acres, the farm, Acres Wild, plays host to the, those seeking an alternative lifestyle experience. The third curve, the end of growth as we know it, is the outcome of Mansoor's own journey, an extensively researched piece of work that examines the correlation between the compulsions of economic growth and the limits imposed on us by nature. The third curve is a part of Oh, is a one part of the trilogy that includes a second work of non-fiction which examines the pathogenic nature of civilization. On to Mr. Mansoor Khan. The blood donation camp is on, so uh, whoever wants to donate blood can please move to the venue. Thanks. Hello. Uh, okay, thank you for attending and thanks Peter for inviting me to speak. Uh, the subject of my talk is a little like, but if you look at the name you won't understand what it's about. It's called the third talk. But if you look at the subtitle of my book, which says the end of growth, that says it all. So what I'm talking about, I know that there's a hell of a lot of concern about the environment, ecological issues, and they're killing our forests, they're destroying our rivers, they're polluting our soil. All that is what not, not what I'm going to talk about. Okay? So that's the moral side of what we are screwing up on this planet. This is about whether money can grow or not. So we make growth of money. Our, our premise of economics is that money has to grow. It has time value. You put in 10 lakhs into your fixed deposit and you get 5%, 6%, 7%, or even 3% compounding interest. And we based our complete uh, economic system on that. So our Federal Reserve works that way, our RBI works that way, the World Bank works that way, our companies work that way, you work that way when you uh, start a business. You say, I put in 10 lakhs into the business, I must get some interest return. Whether that is possible or not is what this, what my book questions or whether growth, that is quantitative growth itself, whether that is over. So it's a little difficult, but try to throw out all the moral things from your mind, okay? Because we've heard a lot about the moral mistakes we are making. But right now, forget about the morality. Just to understand this argument, I would request you to not think about the morality of what we are doing wrong. And just think of the possibility. Is it going to be possible? If I allow you to cut all the trees, dam all the rivers, pull out all the iron ore, go to the Arctic and take out all the oil, is it still going to be possible to make growth happen? Is my question. So, I'll make a quick start. You see, we must go through three aspects, three periods that our industrial times have gone through. We went through paradise times. I was born in 58. So, up to, up to middle 60s, we saw that they were paradise times. Anything that you imagined could happen. You had faster computers, faster trains, planes, you know, uh, plenty of food, electronics, and we went to the moon. Okay, we meaning humanity as a civilization, America as a country. But those were paradise times, and we honestly thought that the sky was the limit. We thought that anything is possible. It's just that you have to think about it, and work on it, and you can do it. But then suddenly something went wrong. From the 60s, we started noticing that different life forms were disappearing, the whale, the trees, the forests, the rivers, all these different small isolated things were collecting up as separate dots. But when you collected the dots, it was ecologically collapsed. So suddenly, from paradise times, we went into life systems withering. Okay? So we said, oh, this is an ecological crisis, let's solve this problem, let's put money into these wonderful organizations. But we must continue with our business. So business was meant to go on as usual. 
and here we were trying to solve this ecological crisis. But before we knew, we entered into the third phase. The financial collapse meant that your money, your businesses themselves were failing. So how are you going to go to after the ecological collapse? From around about the late 90s, 2000, we found that money itself was becoming withering, you were having collapses, you were having... 2008 collapse was the ultimate one. So I'll go through these. These three are connected. These are not three separate things. It is... When I go through the lecture, you realize, oh yes, we should have expected this to happen the way in which we have defined money and growth. So 1850 started this concept. This concept of growth, I hope you can see that, never existed before 1850. Whereas we imagine that growth is a fundamental birthright. That things should grow. Things should become more. And we call it progress. So it's built into, even though I've met many ecological and environmental uh, people who are concerned with it, who still feel that yes, we must look after the environment, but growth must go on. You know, our lifestyles should improve. Our cars should get faster, we should get more amenities, you know. So this growth that we call, which is quantitative growth, actually didn't exist. This concept didn't exist before 1850. That everything keeps increasing, your money keeps increasing. It used to be more or less static. So what was it that started this concept? What is it that made us believe that growth can keep just going on happening? Can anything grow forever for that matter? My question is, can anything grow forever? And let's start with this example. We have a mind and we have a body. Our mind comes up with a concept. So I can think of something like I can think of lifting up this glass. My mind is thinking of it, but my body has to actually do it. So in reality, my body has to fulfill my concept. Whatever I was imagining, whatever my mind was thinking of, the body has to do. So that is concept, it's always in red. And reality is the body always in green. Just keep that red and green in mind body and, uh, and uh, mind and body and mind. So then I think of lifting up something heavier because we believe in progress. I lifted up a class. How about lifting up this chair? So I imagine, let me lift up this chair. And once again, my body is able to lift up that chair. So it is successful. But what about if my mind came up with this concept? To lift up this truck. Now it's a, it, is a, it is a normal progression. So you say, why not? I keep lifting up heavier things. I lift up this sofa, I lift up that, I lift up a car. How about this truck? I can't lift up a car either, but supposing I did. But somewhere you're going to reach a point where your mind says do this, but your body cannot do that. And it fails. That means the concept has failed in reality. Concepts and minds have no limits. But bodies have limits. This is something we, now this, you might say is so obvious, why am I even wasting time? It is not so obvious. We come to know shortly that we honestly believe that bodies have no limits. So what is the ultimate concept of truth? I give you that example because to make it personal, you know, to give you an example when you realize about yourself, then you also realize at a larger level. What is the ultimate concept of growth? Can anyone tell? The ultimate concept of growth is money. We believe that money should grow forever. Nothing else can grow forever on this planet. You know that a tree doesn't grow forever, your height doesn't grow forever, your weight doesn't grow forever. Quantitatively, not qualitatively. You can love your parents more. You can love your child more. You can love your wife more. That's qualitative. I'm not talking about qualitative growth, I'm talking about quantitative growth. So we believe that money, and in what way, I'll just show you. So we believe that money grows forever, and now this concept has not come out of an individual mind, it has come out of the mind of the collective financial system. That's all of us. The banks, the, 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 the finance minister, the CEOs, the administrators, everybody, including the local fund one. We all believe that money grows forever. How did this come up? First of all, what is money? First of all, money itself is a concept. You must realize that money is, done, is not something that is value in itself, but money represents value. Here is bread and here is 10 rupees. You don't eat the 10 rupees, you eat the bread. So 10 rupees of the bread represents a token. So it's a map and I call it a concept. So that is the first concept. Each concept that we're going to come up with from our mind is going to be one ring in red over here. Okay? So money is equal to value was the first law that we made for money. And then very soon, when I made money into tokens and I had say, 10 lakh locals. And let's give the example of Peter here. Peter is a very enterprising guy. I'm a lazy guy. I don't do anything with my 10 lakhs. I just keep it under my bed. Peter tells me, why don't you give it to me? Because he has a cake business for instance. So he can buy more sugar, more bread, more eggs, more labor, etc. with the 10 lakhs that he borrows from me. And I say, but why should I lend it to you? He says, because I'll give you 7% return on it. That is called interest. That's called time value. 
So I was very excited because that way my money from 10 lakhs in one year becomes 10 lakhs 70,000. So that we added the second concept from our mind again. And remember, whatever concept you pull out from your mind, the body has to actually do it. That means Peter has to actually find more eggs, find more sugar. He wants to grow, but he has to find it. The next year, he doesn't return that money to me because he says, look, if you let me keep this 70,000 interest, I will give you 7% on top of that. Now, earlier I would have just got 70,000 going like this, that's called linear growth. So my 10 lakhs would increase slowly. Every year 70,000, 70,000, 70,000, 70,000. But now he says, you guys know this, but just go through these steps. I'm just trying to take you through the journey of why we believe that money should grow. So because you 7% on 10 lakhs, 70,000. I see. That's more than the first year. He said it's not only more than the first year, but it looks like this. Now just look at the difference. Now my money is not growing like this because it is reaching the right side of the paper. This doesn't even reach the right side of the paper, it goes straight to the sky. So it is an amazing concept. Concept number three is absolutely amazing. So he keeps the money for the next 20 years or 40 years. I don't even want to take it back from him because every year he is giving me compounding interest. 10 lakhs, 70,000 and that looks like that. That has no limits. That's called perpetual exponential growth by the way. It's not just growth. It's a very, very peculiar thing. It has no limits and I call it the money curve. And the layers of concepts that make this money curve possible, I call it the money onion. Please keep this in mind because it's a layer, like an onion has layers. We have created four layers of concepts. But we pull out the concepts from our mind. It doesn't take anything to pull out another concept from our mind whenever we are in trouble. Okay? So for the time being, we decided that this is how money should grow. And there was nothing wrong because he had a genuine profit and his cakes were good. So people gave him 14% margin, 70 capital, etc. So he's not doing anything fraud. Mind you, my talk is not about morality. I'm not saying that it's immoral to grow. My question is, can you grow? This looks dangerous. That means money can it really grow like that. Can you imagine where that curve is going? And it goes faster and faster. I'll just show it to you. Why did we love this idea? I loved it because when he took 10 lakhs from me and promised me that, my 10 lakhs at 7% doubles every 10 years. And in, a de in 10 decades, my 10 lakhs becomes 100 crores. That means I don't need to work. My kids don't need to work. That is amazing. It goes 1024 times just in 10 decades. That's definitely in the lifetime of my kids. But what most people don't tell you is that while your money is going like this, just look at the shape of that curve, it's exactly the same. While the money is growing that way, something else is growing that way. And that is the consumption of resources. So it's not like you can just make that money out of nowhere. You have to use eggs and sugar and labor and space and energy exactly like that. So look at the next curve. This shows you from 1800 to make money grow like this. Okay? For money to grow in an exponential form, just take a look. 1800 and we are here. We actually, we are past this. It's gone up. Whether this is real or not, we just figure out. But it's going in, in our minds, it's going like this. Hey, what is happening with energy? Energy is following the same pattern. Most people think it's our concept that is making it happen. But I think it's the energy that makes it happen. If that energy was not there, you cannot make this grow like this. So you can see there's a direct correlation between energy and uh, money. Now, can energy continue that path? We will see. 1850 started this because of oil. Oil is a unique kind of energy. It is stored 250 million years of sunlight. It's an amazing store of energy. That's why growth started from 1850. That's why it never existed before that because we didn't have oil. So oil has made that possible. It has made us believe that we can expand. Today, just read your papers, your economic times, your financial papers, your business time. Everybody's talking about growth. So Chidambaram is talking about growth. Pontic Singh Aluwalia is talking about growth. Your neighbor is talking about growth. Everybody's crying that growth is over. But what made it possible, nobody knows. And what will make it impossible, nobody knows. But we'll still vote for somebody who will bring us growth back. Whether it's possible or not, whether the guy is a good guy or a bad guy, we'll bring him back. That's our religion. So take a look at that. But where does that oil or where does that energy come from? You remember I spoke about the mind. Now let's talk about the body. Because the body has to fulfill it. I can come out with any concept from my mind, but can the body do it? And what is the body in this case? In this case, the body is the body of the earth. I don't know any other source from where we can get energy, resources, iron, copper, etc. 
And the earth is finite. And you don't need a, even a three-year-old child will tell you that, but our economists don't know that. A three-year-old child knows that the earth is finite. But an economist honestly believes that the earth is infinite. And that's why we made that infinite rule for money. But how does the earth behave? This is one more thing that they do not teach us in our schools. Can anyone tell me how the earth behaves? In what form does it give you energy? In what shape does it give you energy? At what speed does it give you energy? Can anyone tell me? How many of you have been through college? <laughs> Shame on you, you've got to join me. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. You guys shouldn't feel bad because I spoke at the Energy Resource Institute in Delhi. The Energy Resource Institute who are doing all the funding and studies in energy. And when I asked the same question, how many of you knew that the earth behaves in a bell curve? They were honest enough to say none of us knew that. Now just imagine. You know, you know Einstein's E is equal to MC squared, you know Max Planck, you know Heisenberg, you know all sorts of things, you know what Hitler did and what, what you know, everything. But this is one thing that has been missed out of our education system, is that the earth behaves in a bell curve. Now what does that mean? It means actually, you know what the curve is called? It's called the normal distribution curve. Because it's normal, your body behaves like this. Many things behave like this, okay? And so does the resources that the earth gives you. It, what it means, let me explain to you, rather than just call it a bell curve. It means that if you, say, drill one oil well, okay, you will get less oil from it, then you will get more. And when half the oil is finished in that well, you will be at the maximum. That means half is still left, but it starts going down. The speed at which it is giving it to you goes down. Okay? Now just imagine, let's take the example of your petrol tank in your car. It doesn't behave that way. When your petrol tank in your car is half empty, does your car slow down? No. So we think that the earth is a petrol tank. But the earth is not a petrol tank. The earth behaves in a very different way, it's porous rock. So in the beginning the oil is in pressure, under pressure. So, when it, it's, uh, so it comes out fast. But at the midway point the pressure drops. And the second half it gets slow. Everything, not only oil wells, whether it's a copper mine, whether it's, it's called, in a way, in economic terms, it's called diminishing returns. Kind of similar, but geologically it is different. But this is very, very crucial. This, if you don't know, then you make wrong plans. At the halfway mark, you reach the peak. Remember this word. This four-letter word is going to feature in our headlines. Just like global warming, the word peak doesn't register. The word peak oil doesn't register. We don't even know about it in India. It's a geological reality. It's science. So we are, if the moment you reach the halfway point, it starts going down and this follows the laws of geology. It does not follow the laws of economics. The laws we made for money are the laws of economics, which we made from our mind. But whatever rules we make from our mind doesn't mean the body has to fulfill it. Like I told you, I want to lift up heavier things. But my body says, no, enough, I can't. Similarly, the earth says, no, enough, I can't. And the earth defines what, how much it will give you. And that looks like this. This was discovered by this guy, I didn't make up this rule, King Hubbard. He was working for Shell Oil in America and he discovered this. And he was, that was his job. He was not an environmentalist. He was not a tree hugger. He was not a Marxist. He was not a, you know, Luddite. He was a guy who was a hardcore capitalist, technique, engineer, whose job was to figure out how much oil does each oil well that belongs to Shell Oil, how well it is doing. And he was surprised. That each oil well, as they drilled a new one, it would go. If they if they discovered that there were 100,000 barrels in, the, in that well, which they could figure out, you know, 100, 500, whatever it was, he found that when it reached the middle, it would fall. Then he measured all the wells in that area, say for instance in, in, in a particular county or, or in a state, an area. He found that each well behaved like this. Some wells were bigger, some wells were smaller. But when you add all the wells in that area, it still gave you a bell curve. That means that county could still reach the peak and then drop. So even if that county had 50 million barrels or 1 billion barrels for that matter, it didn't matter. At the middle point, it still behaved that way. You are in trouble. When you reach the top, you are in trouble because it starts going down. Well, nobody wanted to believe it and they all called him a, a madman. They said, this guy is nuts. We do not believe it. America has enough oil forever. I mean, they were arrogant enough to say forever. Obviously, nothing lasts forever. But this is much worse than forever, which is as early as 19, <coughs> as early as 1970, he predicted that oil would peak 
and in 1970s, US oil peaked. That's why America went to the Middle East. They said, oh God, we've got to go somewhere. And they taught the Arabs how to drill oil out of their uh, sand. The Arabs had no clue they were floating on oil. But the US had to go there. UK had to go there, the European countries had to go there because their economies were more developed and they needed a lot more energy to run their, their industries. If they hadn't gone there, guess what would have happened? Their money wouldn't grow. They knew that. So they said, okay, it's not available here, let's go to that place. And then we did that with Russia, we did that with some other place, we did it with South America, and now we have finished all the places where oil can, we can get more oil. That I'll show you in this graph. So once again, mind, body. Your mind is saying money should, and this is actual numbers by the way. Uh, earlier Peter had asked me whether I had actual numbers. These are actual numbers of money from the, from 1900. And remember that law that we made that money must grow exponentially? We've been able to do it. That means money is actually growing very fast. So whatever we thought from our mind, we've been able to do with the body. Uh, sorry, with the, with the money. But what about reality? How do you get oil? Oil doesn't go like that. Oil goes in a bell curve. Just like the earlier two curves I showed you, mind is saying this, body is saying this, well it's actually behaving there. Our numbers show that the earth behaves like this. These are real numbers of oil production from the earth. Total oil production. Global oil production. And from 1900 we went up, there was a little dip here, there was the OPEC problem, there was a crisis, and gone up here. The gentleman I showed you before, Hubbard, he had also predicted that global oil, now this is the amazing scientific uh, uh, contribution that he has done, that just from the numbers, he predicted that global oil will reach its peak in the year 2000. It actually reached it in 2005. Okay? But that was because of this. Because of this geopolitical event, when the whole world used less oil. Had this event not happened, it would have gone up like this in the year 2000. Exactly in the year 2000, he would, he would have achieved the amazing feat of predicting when, when global oil will be. It shifted a little bit, but it doesn't matter. Just because you shift something five years down this way doesn't mean that, that it has changed anything at all. <clears throat> what it means is that these two look different and they, they are in trouble. If money wants to grow that way, but oil behaves like this, because oil is the blood of your industrial society. See, I can't go into these details. Why is it um, that I'm talking about oil? You have to read my book uh, for that, or you have to go on the net, and there's lots of data to read. Oil is the blood of modern industrial society. It not only runs the world physically, like in terms of your trucks, trains, planes, ships, but it also builds the world, like your roads, with the bitumen, byproduct, the chairs you're sitting on, the plastic spindles, the fertilizer, the insulators. It builds your world. It's not just some source of energy, you know, we just plug it in and plug it out. No. It's something completely different. It is the blood of modern industrial society. So if anything happens to oil, we are in trouble. In my book, I also explain that people keep loosely talking about alternative energy. Solar panels, wind mills, nuclear plants, fuel cells. They are all built with oil. You fundamentally use oil to build those, to run them, to maintain them, to dismantle them, to build another one. So those are not sources of energy. Those are energy converters. It's like you take borrow money from your father and you run a business. And you're saying, I'm earning this money. But you're saying, no, your father is saying you're not running anything, you're taking my money to run it. Because your, your, your business is running at a loss. <coughs> That's exactly what happens with alternatives. You use a lot more oil to make solar panels. And in the end, they only give you electricity. Electricity doesn't run your world. Liquid fuels runs your world. Which is why, just to, uh, very briefly, that's why I'm talking about oil. So this is the crucial thing. This is the body. Oil is the body. And money is the mind. Now let's see what happens when you put them together. Can you see something odd? Your mind is trying to go there. Your money is trying to go there. Your concept is trying to go there. And the body is going in a different direction. But there is something very interesting. <coughs> is that up to a point they go together. So when they go together up to a point, that was paradise times. Remember the first phase I told you, paradise times. It is paradise when your body can do what your mind is saying. You feel, wow, I wanted to do this, I've done it. I wanted to do this, I've done it. I wanted to do more, I've done it. It's paradise times. When the earth was able to give you more oil according to your more industrial demand, can you see both the curves are going together? 
it is paradise guys. Nobody has actually put these two curves together, let me tell you. I am one of the first people to actually put it together, just to put it in a very simple way. That this is what's happening and that's what, it's no surprise. So in that phase, from 1900 or 1850 up to mid 60s, late 60s when we landed on the moon, we didn't land on the moon because we are very intelligent or Americans are very intelligent. Yes, they are. But despite your intelligence, which is a core factor, you need something else. Like I ask you to bake a cake, but I don't give you eggs. Can you do it for me? I won't give you flour. Can you, can you bake it for me? So the ingredients are the starting point. And when you have the ingredients and the energy, then you apply your mind and then you get the product. You do not make a product out of your mind. So, the same thing happened here. So the body was able to give us, the earth was able to give us oil in ever increasing quantities. It was following the exponential curve. The bell curve is exponential in the first part. So they were paradise times. But what happened after that? And by the way, to make it grow that way, we were using these four laws, you remember? That money is value, interest, compounding interest, perpetually. Perpetually thought was obvious. We expected this to, money to keep growing like this. But these were the three rules. This is called a compounding curve. Okay? But what happened after that point? Which I call point one over there. Late 60s. The numbers, the numbers show that oil started tapering off. Exactly as Hubbard had said. So oil slowed down. But you are saying money has to grow. How can money grow? How can products grow? If your energy is less. How can Tata make more trucks? How can they make 100% more trucks when the earth is only giving you 10%, say 80% more oil? So what happened then was that we institutionalized another concept of stock markets. Now stock market concept was there before, but what we said was, hey, let's institutionalize borrowing. Why would you lend to me? Because I'll give you a dividend. But who's interested in the dividend, which is actual production? I'm interested in the stock price, which is imaginary. So we were we incorporated an imaginary perceived, that was the first time that we imagined a perceived value of our money growth. It was going to happen sooner or later. It was going to happen because this, this curve can never go like that. But we said, oh, we are so intelligent, we will come up with newer concepts that will make our money growth real or true or appear true. And that's how we honestly believe that stock markets are increasing the value of your money. Just because a thousand of you are betting on a share doesn't mean Tata is making more drugs. It just means that a thousand of you are betting on that share. And if 2,000 better on it, it goes even higher. And Tata is making the same amount of trucks. And how many trucks can Tata make? How much oil and, and, and stuff you get from the, from the earth. And giving the example of Tata, I have nothing against Tata. My wife has shares in Tata. But the point is, the point I'm trying to make is that all of us collectively believe that. But very soon that was not enough. Can you see something is going here? Growth. Every time we add, we are in trouble, we add another concept and we must keep this going. This, we said, has to be perpetuated. Law number four. But again, and remember this curve goes faster and faster. It's going here, in the next year it goes here, in the next year it goes there, in the next year it goes there. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ever increasing speed. It's not only vertical, but it increases faster and faster. So how do you cope with that? If you were, if you, if you were a manager of a bank, how would you cope with that? You have to return compounding interest to your shareholders or your depositors. So we said, okay, let's have fractional reserve bank. Because earlier in banks, you could only lend 10% and hold 90%. If I had 100 crores, the bank would only lend 10 crores to institutions and hold the other 90. Because you are the depositors, what if you come back and you want that money? That is, that is the safety of the bank. It's a 10% it lends. But now it has to grow so fast that lending 10% is not enough. You remember lending, it started with lending. I have to lend money to Peter for it to grow. If I don't lend it and keep it under my, under my pillow, it doesn't grow. So the very first principle of money to grow is lending. Interest, compound interest and so on. So the banks were forced. They said, oh come on, yeah. we can't only lend 10%, we must lend 20% and hold 80%. That wasn't enough. Then they said, hey, let's lend 30% and hold 70%. That's called fractional reserve banking. Actually, you are holding a fraction of the reserve bank. But if you do that, if I've lent out 50% and I'm only holding 50%, and if all of you want and you need your money, what do I do? That means something else is going up on the right side, that's called risk. On the right side, something else is going up. While you're trying to go for growth, you're also including risk. And that's what we did. Because when we came into trouble and you had used up all the money in the system, how much money could you print? equal to how much gold you have. 
So we said, hey, this is not fair. Nixon said, you know, we have to print more money. Let's remove the silly gold standard. Gold standard is like a ceiling. You can only print as much money as there is gold. Now imagine you put a plant here, the plant is growing. And you're watering it every day and giving it nutrients and everything nicely is growing. And it reaches the roof. So what do you do? You trim the plant? No. We decided to remove the roof. That's what we did. We said, hey, this plant has to keep growing. Let's remove the roof. And the water came in, the rain came in, because that's risk. So Nixon removed the gold standard in 70. So each time we are in trouble, we add another concept and say, keep money growing. Remove the gold standard. Your currency is fiat. Your, your currency doesn't, is not even backed by anything. If I want to go back earlier, I could take my 100 rupee note to the bank and the bank was, was indebted to give me a certain amount of gold back. That was the value of that 100 rupees, a certain amount of gold. Try doing that now. It's fiat in every country. So that means it doesn't even represent anything of any value. Not that I think gold is of any value, but whatever it may be. We, so we added the next one. Again, the curve started going higher and we had to make money grow faster. So we said, hey, now Peter's business has reached, say, a thousand crores. He's making, he's, actually a large part of it is in, is, is, in, uh, is in stocks. To pick up a thousand crore loan by putting only 50, he's lending it to him. They're yeah, lending it to him because he says, my business is going to grow, I, I will be able to return a thousand crores. This is called leveraging. This concept is called leveraging. Where you leverage and pick up a bigger amount of money with a smaller amount of money. But if he picks up a thousand crores, with only 50 crores. And if his business doesn't do well and he doesn't earn a thousand crores, what's going to happen? He's in trouble. That means the risk is tremendous. So what he does is he says, I'll take an option on it. So we added another concept called options. Are you noticing how we're adding newer and newer concepts? Every time you have to deal with bigger and bigger parts of money growth. What does option mean? Option means that he's picked up the thousand crores with the option that if he cannot pay, he'll pay a down payment of a hundred crores more. So the price or penalty that he pays is only 100 crores instead of paying the full. But how do you price that? How do you know how much he should pay? Should it be 100 crores? Should it be 80 crores? Should it be 120 crores? So we came up with this. Can anybody please explain this to me? Please. No, no. Come on, your, your money is behind this, okay? So whether you realize it or not, Mr. Rajanam is talking about this. Now you read the newspapers, he's forcing banks to go, these are called derivatives. Derivatives are complex, calculus level bets. Not your stock bets. No, the simple, harmless bets compared to this bet. This bet is like you put one apple and you put 10,000 mirrors around and you say, hey, 10,000 apples. <laughs> it's like that. I'm not joking. It is, these are bets. The only thing is telling you is how one person out of 10,000 can win that bet. That's not even a social model. So economics has suddenly become anti-social actually. <laughs> so he's telling you how you can win this. But I don't care if Peter loses and all, all of you guys lose. But he should win. That's what Mr. Black and Scholes, who wrote this equation, were intending and they got the Nobel Prize. There's nothing noble about it. <laughs> but they got the Nobel Prize and guess what? They used that same equation and started a company and lost 4.7 billion dollars <laughs> and went bankrupt. And guess who bailed them out? The US government. Now is that a capitalistic system? So they're going back on their own fundamental concept. I think US was the most, I'm not blaming US, I'm not against US, I'm not against anybody. But I'm saying this is what happens when you go down the wrong road and you say no, speed is most important. We have to keep increasing our speed, I don't care how the road turns. That's what happened. So there are no bad guys in my story, just only bad ideas. So this is the bad idea that we had that money should grow forever. So we added options. And all this was considered brilliant stuff. These were guys from MIT and Princeton. I went to MIT, but I don't think it's brilliant. From guys from Princeton, from Harvard. They were mathematicians who were pulled by the finance sector to say, think of an equation that, that will make money appear as if it's growing. They said, sure. And they sat down, and that's what they came out with. That equation that you saw there. It's called the Black and Scholes options pricing formula. That means how do you price an option in this complex setup? But money doesn't stop because you said it has to grow further. And now we had reached another ceiling. In 1929, when the world banks this went suddenly very loud. When the world there was a there was a collapse, if you remember, the 1929 uh, collapse of stock markets and everything in US. Ever since Commercial banks 
and investment banks could not be one entity. Because if your money is in a commercial bank and the bank is playing around with your money and investing it in risky things, you are at risk. And most people lost their money. So there was a, there was a law called the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act was put into place to prevent banks from playing around with depositors' money. And it said that you cannot use the depositors' money for investment, these kind of things. You know, they have to be two separate entities. But the problem is that the banks, like I told you, when they started fractional reserve banking, they have to lend more. They need to use this money. They need this act to go away. So they pressurized the US government for over 50 years or more. From 1930 to somewhere in around, because they have to grow. It was like to hell with the ceiling. The plant has to grow. And they removed it. And when they removed it, the banks could use, you know that complex equation I told you about? They could use those kind of principles with all this money and come up. Okay, sorry, I missed out two of them. That was derivatives and that was... With that, they could come up with complex financial instruments. That means now they could take all this money, which is half of it is imaginary, and come up with these papers, CDOs, SIVs, slice and dice, hedge funds. How many of you have, have you heard of these terms? Have you heard of these terms? These are respected and valued. They are completely bogus. They are instruments of mass financial destruction as Warren Buffett said. Warren Buffett is the biggest investor in the world with the best record. And he said, I don't even understand this. Because they are so complex, they are so mathematical. They don't represent anything in my mind. So we needed repealing of the Glass-Steagall Act and derivatives. These two things to come up with this paper growth. So suddenly, the housing mortgage were packaged together and sold in China as a growth instrument. Chinese didn't even know what they were buying. The Japanese didn't know what they were buying. Most people in, in Europe and America didn't know. Now it's coming to India. Watch it. So we managed to make it grow. That curve was floating high above, hundreds of trillions of dollars up there. There is real productivity was down there. That was end of phase two. And we were talking about this. This is what I call the growth trap. This is the, this is the diagram that you need to have in all our schools. That if you have a concept that you want to grow like this, it's a concept, that's your desire, that's not reality. But your reality is like this, that means if your concept is exponential and your reality is bell, then you get three phases. The first phase, second phase and the third phase, where they actually go apart. But you need different concepts to make it appear true. When you see each concept was introduced at a particular time when you needed it. And the gap between it is increasing. So you needed to make your money grow from here to here, you came up with derivatives. You needed to make it grow from here to there, you came up with finance. This is hundreds of trillions of dollars. I'm sure nobody can estimate what a trillion dollars is. It, it is unimaginable amount of money. It's a thousand billion. And a billion is a thousand million. And poor Richie Rich's father was only a millionaire. You remember? Those comic books. So where have they reached? Obviously, they have reached in some dangerous zone. Unbelievable growth made possible by newer and newer concepts pulled out from the mind, which we believe to be true. But there's crazy risk building up on the right side. And we've been trying to suppress that risk with all kinds of mathematical tricks. But the risk is building up. It's under the surface. It's waiting to blow up. And we knew about it. People like us who were studying this, in 2001, 2, 3, we said it's going to blow up. It's going to blow up. And it blew up in 2008. This is about the false economy, just before I go there. This is actual, actual GDP. That means you've made products, like Peter has made cakes. This is real. 14 trillion dollars, US GDP. World GDP is 50 trillion dollars. Global production for the last 100 years, real things like recycles and this and that. Actual production over the last 100 years, global industrial production is 100 trillion dollars. And guess what this is? Just 2007 derivatives. A thousand trillion dollars of gas. This is gas. This is vapor. How can you have the world derivative value in one year equal to a thousand trillion dollars when the global industrial production itself has been only a hundred trillion dollars over the last hundred years? What is real about this? Nothing is real about that. It's imaginary. A large part. And that's the reason why we knew, but this guy didn't know, he was a banker. And we are people who are watching. We knew something was going to happen. He's looking a bit worried. That was the false value in the economy. This was the level of false value. The real value was up down here. We reached P coin. Remember I told you this term. Nobody in India knows this. Very few people know this. P coin means you reach the peak. 
of oil. And then you only get less. You reach peak water, you reach peak copper, you reach peak phosphorus, you reach peak iron, everything reaches a peak. But the most important peak is oil. Because oil runs your industrial world. When we reach peak oil, March 2008, the explosion that we were waiting for happened. Because 2005 reached the top of the curve. It took three years for the world to wobble and fall apart. It was no surprise to us. All the economists were surprised. All the bankers were surprised. Mr. Talibi, Nassim Talibi has written Black Swan or some, something like that. It was not a black swan. It was not a black swan event. A black swan event is an event you cannot predict. Because you've been seeing white swans up till now, you say all swans are white. And then one day you see a black swan, you say, oh my god, what is that? That's called a black swan event. This was not a black swan event for us. It was absolutely predictable, scientific, geological reality. And that's what happened. There was $50 trillion got wiped out. And much more was going to get wiped out, but the government bailed them out. You know, they went and plugged in and gave the banks who had in fact caused the problem. They bailed them out. 50 trillion, the whole thing would have collapsed. So this is a story. Here the growth is true, because your mind and body are in sync. You, you make an exponential curve from your, from your mind, but the earth begins in a bell curve. Just put it together. This is scientific stuff. Nobody has put this together, but I have and I put the numbers together. And it really it shows us what has happened in these three phases. From 1850 to 1960, whatever we imagined, the growth was true. 69 man landed on the moon and has never reached there after that. It takes a lot of money and energy to go to the moon. After that, your body slows down now. And your mind says, I want to go faster. You're building up a false value. So here the growth is false in this phase, phase two, up to the top, which is 2005. Okay. After 2005, we are entering uncharted territory. We are into perpetual dissent. Nobody accepts it. They say, oh, this is because of the Congress government. If you bring the BJP government, it all will be fine. <laughs> well, what about Europe? Europe doesn't have a Congress government. What about US? What about Japan? What about all these guys? What about China? China's growth rate fell from 9.3. Uh, 9 and 3 quarter, now they are struggling and aiming at 7.5. How much of it is real? I mean, I don't know. But they are saying it. So something else in common is happening. It's not about bungling. And it's certainly not about corruption. Corruption is our tradition. <laughs> <laughs> we have traditionally been corrupt. How, how have we said? It's not that we have become more corrupt. Have, I think we have become less corrupt actually. We are just hearing bigger numbers. So second part, growth is false. And the third part, which we are entering, which is what the title of my book is, growth fails. Obviously it fails. Because you are saying I am going there and your body is going here. It has to fail. 1850 started this concept which got ingrained in our conscience. Growth, growth, growth. Growth is progress. Growth is good. Growth must be achieved. Get somebody who gets growth. Growth is a six letter word which is our religion. It doesn't matter whether you are a Hindu or a Muslim or a Catholic or a Jew or a, or a I don't know what, atheist. <laughs> Our religion is growth. It's a common religion. The largest religion is the religion of growth. And we believe we should do anything. Cut all the trees, dam all the rivers, remove all the iron, go to the uh, go to Antarctic, dig for oil, uh, wipe out the boreal forest, get our tar sands, dig five miles below the sea. Anything is allowed in the name of growth. But sadly, we are in this phase. 2005 started this. We are experiencing shrinkage. We are noticing shutdowns, people losing jobs, production gone down. Only the stock market is high. The stock market is betting. What is the stock market is going to hit 22,000? Who cares? People are saying, look, that's great, 22,000. That means you are betting more because real stuff is not happening. Real productivity is not happening. You cannot really run things. So don't go by the stock market. As I already told you, that's a betting model. So people today are saying Indian economy is doing well because stock market is doing well. Indian economy is doing very badly because the stock market is doing well. Because you obviously bet when real things don't happen. Growth is in fact a disease. I'm coming to the end guys. Just imagine if this is a, pay, a, a friend of yours who is lying in hospital. Uh, these were all his, all his life signs. His heartbeat, his cholesterol level, his body temperature, his sugar level and all that. They are supposed to be at a particular level. And all his levels are going up like this. His heart rate is going exponentially up. His sugar level is going exponentially up. His body temperature is going exponentially up. What would you say is happening to your friend? 
he's not in a good way, he's dying. Doomsday. Doomsday. He, he's, he's on his death day. But sadly, it is much more than a friend of ours. This is the Earth. These are life signs of the Earth. Species extinction, exponential. Loss of tropical rainforest, dark green, exponential. Some of these we started measuring later. Some of them we were aware of earlier. But they are all exponential. Fishery is exploited, exponential. Water usage, exponential. CO2 concentration, exponential. Ozone depletion, exponential. Number of cars, exponential. Obviously number of cars means amount of pollution also. Paper consumption, exponential. But there is one more thing which is exponential here. The GDP of the world. But that's what we wanted. We have made up our mind that GDP of the world has to be exponential because money has to grow exponentially. You can do anything to make that money grow exponentially. No matter how many trees we need to cut, no matter how much water we need, no matter how much iron ore we need, we have to make money grow exponentially. So this is the trigger. The trigger is if you say, I want to drink exponentially for instance, then obviously my liver, my heart, my this thing will collapse in an exponential form. So our idea was a diseased idea. The very idea was a diseased idea. The idea of GDP growing exponentially, which we incorporated in our financial thinking, is a crazy idea. So obviously the earth is dying. So growth for the sake of growth is in fact the ideology of a cancer cell. When somebody gets cancer, God forbid, what happens? One cell splits to two, two become four, four become eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, two fifty-three, five twenty. When that happens, is your my God, let's start in Hinduja hospital. So we'll spend 500 crores and start in your hospital because we believe cancer is a bad thing. So what have we done in our financial system? We've incorporated the same ideology of a cancer cell. Cancer cell is saying, I'm going to eat up your liver, I'm going to eat up your heart, I'm going to do everything to grow down, to double every you know, few hours. So whatever the cancer cell is doing is exactly what we are doing. The ideology of, of our economic system is a cancer. That was said by Edward Paul Abbey, but nobody wanted to listen to him, they thought he was nuts. And then, what is the third curve? Coming to the end guys, I, I, I wish you would ask me a lot of questions. You remember the first curve that came from the mind, the red curve, the exponential curve. <coughs> to chase that first curve, we pushed the earth so that the earth behaved in a bell curve. The earth does not like to behave in a bell curve. Your body does not like to behave in a bell curve. When you push it, it tries its best and then collapses. So that was the second curve. But what is the third curve? The third curve is nothing but the total amount of energy that the earth gets from the sun. That was our budget. The budget under which the earth was supposed to run energetically, not money, throw money out of your mind. Money is a representation of energy. This was the amount of sunlight. In winter, it's down. It's high. Closer to the sun, it's high. No matter what happens, it never goes out of this band. The amount of sun's energy which falls on the planet is goes between two bands. And that is our income. That is the budget in which all our beautiful things form. The dinosaurs, the butterflies, the flowers, the tropical rainforests, us, our city, everything, not our city, sorry, that came with something else. But everything else, all other forms of life, the microbes, the bacteria, the fish, the clouds, the rain, the rivers, the fog, the mist, all operated in this budget. That is the budget of energy that the earth sincerely gets and it should operate in. And when it collected, this budget keep collect, kept collecting and collecting and collecting under the earth for 250 million years, it became oil. That was your fixed deposit. So what did we do? Like spoiled children, and you find your great great grandfather's loot, you burn it. You buy a Ferrari, you make transcontinental planes, you make the internet, and every fast, fabulous thing that we have done has been on stored energy. 250 million years of sunlight, 150 I'll say years, but actually I made it simpler so that it's easy to calculate. Because we finished half of it in 150 years. Anybody an accountant here? <coughs> Please tell me whether this uh, uh, this uh, balance sheet is is healthy. <laughs> is it a healthy balance sheet your company is doing like this? Harini? Half of it we have burnt, half of 150 million year capital you have burnt in 150 years. The word sustainable should be thrown out from everywhere, from every textbook of even environmentalists. 
we should we have to realize that it is not sustainable at any level. There are a lot of things that are going to go away. That we imagine, no, no, we'll keep these for ourselves and we'll grow a few trees and everything will be fine. Sorry. A lot of the things that you imagine are going to go away. Because this is the deficit. So we are at the top. We are at the maximum consumption of energy. We very, very high up. And because we are consuming that much energy, we have fabulous things. And you say, what are you talking? We are doing the best we ever could. So obviously things will get better. No. If you throw a ball out of the uh, out of the 30th floor, it goes faster and just, just the ball it hits the ground, it's the fastest. So if you were measuring speed as a, as a, as a means of well-being, it's not a means of well-being. You're in great trouble because you're going really fast and now we're at the peak and we have to, now we're in descent. We are in energy descent. Now there are two ways to come down. Either you come down to denial. We are in denial. So what are we saying? Get that other guy back to be the Prime Minister because he'll get a growth back. <laughs> and what does he say? Okay, open up all those iron ores, this thing, this thing, this thing. Goa should just uh, tear up all its uh, mountains. And what are all these silly things called rivers? Let's dam them, let's take that water, grow sugar cane, that's an industry. Let's do this. Of course. I'm saying let's do it. I'm on his side. But even then he won't be able to make growth happen. That is my challenge. That is our challenge. So you can burn everything that is left. But what you will result in is holding status quo for a while, trash, collapse. Again holding status quo, collapse. This is called the collapse model. When you stretch your body, take steroids, your body collapses after one year. Then you take some more steroids to get that achievement. Again it collapses. So this is called the collapse model, which we are right now kind of following. I'm not saying that you guys agree with it, but that's what's happening. The other way to come down is called transition. Transition is when you recognize that growth is over. So you're not trying for growth. You're saying, we know we're going to go down, which is the smoothest way to go down? Localization. The discussions that you're all having here. Local food. Community skills. You know, things like that. You know, taking care of your soil. Not wasting water. Making industries and things which do not depend on too, too many resources. All these are aspects of transition, but we have to understand one thing. Transition is a deeper thought than just putting CFL bulbs. It's a far deeper thought than just having an energy efficient car. Again, I explain that. Because it's not an efficiency that does it, it's your fundamental money model. I can make everything efficient, but if my money model is based on growth, all that efficiency I'm going to use to grow in fact. If I make a more efficient uh, spray, spraying gun, I'll spray more cans or more cars in, and my industry will say, look, I'm using an energy efficient machine. It's not about the energy efficient machine, it's about how much you're growing, how much, how, what is your total output. <coughs> so transition is we come down, but either way, whether we come down in denial, screaming, being pulled by our heels, dragging along, losing everything, or whether we come smoothly. If we come smoothly, we'll preserve the qualities of our, of our world. And we'll land again at the third curve. Because that is the only budget we have. This is a false budget. When we finish burning all this, we are going to come down to the true budget of energy that the earth always had. And that is the third curve. That is the amount of energy that we get from the sun. There is no way you can live outside that budget. We lived outside the budget because we found stored energy. Now we can't just come down and say, oh, that's very bad. Then we must come down straight here. No, you can't. Because you build systems in such a way that you need to slowly re-moderate those systems and use that energy sensibly to come back and land. It may take 500 years, but one thing is for sure, that right now, growth is not happening. And all these companies are in trouble. Global uh, uh, governments are in trouble. In Europe, they're saying, they're calling it austerity. You know, which is a very nice word. Austerity makes it sound like a choice. It makes it sound like, you know, there's food, but I don't want to eat it. Actually, it is shrinkage. They should not call it austerity, they should call it shrinkage. And they, there, is, there is no choice for them to grow. So they are not throwing out their bad debt, they are holding on to the bad debt and imagining that they will be able to resurface it some other way. But it's not going to happen. So acceptance is what transition means. Transition is a deep subject. It's dealt with in chapter 5 of my book in a very brief way. I cannot cover it all in chapter 5, but that's the only way that we have to. Which way now? Deal with reality. Or reality will deal with Thank you. Thank you. I have some good news for you. 
I brought some books to sell, but you don't need to buy it if you don't want to uh, spend money. I've got a, a whole lot of books which I printed with slight mistakes. I'll send a whole bunch uh, to Peter uh, as soon as I can, maybe a month down the line. Uh, and please uh, register with him. If you want to spend 400, you can buy this. If you feel that you want to avail of the free offer, because I, 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 I printed it myself, and I printed some 7,000 extra copies with a mistake, and I don't know what to do with it. But I'm giving it very uh, judiciously to people like you who take the trouble to come and listen to thoughts, you know, and, and make an effort. So I think you all deserve it. But if your choice is yours, there are some for sale here. But if you want a free copy, just sign up with Peter and he will give it to you. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. 